All right, let's talk about the first stage in the modal model of memory. Let's talk about sensory memory, something most people don't even realize is a type of memory because it happens so briefly and so behind the scenes. But without this first step holding initial sensory input, we wouldn't be able to get anything meaningful into short term memory. We'd just be overwhelmed with the undifferentiated chaos of every bit of light or sound or touch hitting our sensory receptors. So let's start with a couple examples of sensory memory to give you a feel for what it is we're really talking about here. If you've ever used sparklers and kind of paid some attention while spinning it around, what happens is actually pretty weird. Like the sparkler can be in one place at a time, so we should only be seeing a little point of light at any given time. Yet if someone spins it around or moves it quickly, we see an entire trail of light which means we're actually perceiving the light for fractions of a second after it's moved or disappeared out there in the world. The experience we have of a whole circle of light doesn't match the reality out there, but instead it's our brain basically working through the input to our retinas across time. So the info is being stored somewhere in our brain, at least temporarily, and what we're perceiving is something more like the overlapping memory traces of where the light was. Hell, you can even use this persistence of vision effect to get a perception of motion even for things that aren't moving. Like it's easy to set up a display with a bunch of lights where the lights don't move at all. Nothing in the picture here will be moving at all. But because our brain keeps processing a light briefly after it's turned off, it kind of fills in some of the blanks and the processing of different lights overlaps so we get a perception of some moving object from totally static lights turning on and off at the right time, like in this video here. So again, there's no real movement in this. It's just lights turning on and off. I mean, they're moving the camera, right? But, but we're gonna perceive a circle or a triangle or a star as if it's moving there. It's really just lights turning on and off at the right time, but our brain is still processing those lights. So we get a persistence of vision effect. Same idea here with this one. So this one just has some little LED lights kind of straight in a row on this one piece, but when it spins around at the right speeds, we get a persistence of vision effect in the way our brain kind of processes it all in sensory memory. So I'll turn it on, start spinning. Note that the, the three, right, when the three is on the right side, the three isn't actually a light that's staying in place over on the right side our brain constructs the perception of that three because one of the LED lights keeps turning on super briefly, turning on just when the blade is passing the right side, and it turns off again right afterward as it moves away from there. Happens so fast, but our brain keeps processing that bit of light for longer than that in sensory memory. So this looks like we're looking at a clock, but really it's just lights turning on and off super quickly at just the right time as each light reaches a specific place during the spin. So there's no actual 12 there, no actual three sitting there. It's just that little board we saw before with little LEDs on it. Again, this effect is called the persistence of vision. It's, it's evidence of, of sensory memory just storing and processing the input somewhere in our brain, even when it's no longer happening out there in the world. Again, you can kind of see what's happening here once he slows it down. <clears throat> and you remember there was no two, there was no three. <clears throat> There's just this little board with some lights on it that turn on and off at exactly the right time and place as it spins. And slowly, slowly, slowly stops. So, okay, you get the idea, it's persistence of vision. This is actually how flip books work. It's, it's actually how movies and television in general work. You don't usually think of it this way, but a movie or a TV show is just a series of a bunch of static images, all in succession, changing from one static image to the next really, really quickly. That's what we mean by frames when we say like the frame rate of something. A movie is really just a flip book at the right frame rate. And it only works because our brain smooths things out due to that persistence of vision, thanks to our sensory memory. Now, sensory input gets transduced, meaning lighter sound waves get turned into neural firing by our retina or cochlea or whatever, and that gets sent to the brain, 
but much of it gets ignored and doesn't get processed further. So we never notice it and, and we don't remember it, right? All those little details that we don't pay attention to. So let's think about that. How much info could possibly, how much could we possibly use from all the stuff hitting our sensory receptors? People actually tried to get at this question a long time ago. Like back in the 1800s, they tried to test this empirically in the lab to test what they called the span of apprehension, which is just how many items the mind could apprehend or process simultaneously. For example, one of the early tests found a clever way to only show a set of like beans to participants for a very short amount of time. And then they tried to see how many items we can accurately count in that tiny time span before the information is gone and we can, you know, can't count it anymore. So let's try a simplified demonstration of that idea. I'm going to display a little fixation cross in the middle of the screen. So I'll just have you look there in the middle of the screen and then some items will briefly flash on the screen for just a split second and you have to count how many there are, okay? So look at the middle, the fixation cross will come up, then some items, they're gonna flash real quick. Here we go. So how many did you see? There were three in that case. That was a pretty easy one. Let's try another trial. Same deal though. You'll look at the fixation cross in the middle of the screen and then just count how many items flash right after. Here we go. All right, how many that time? That one had five. So maybe you got it right. Maybe you missed it, it's fine, but most people get this one. Let's do another trial, same deal, here we go. And how many that time? Well, if you answered four, you got that one. Let's keep going. Another trial, same thing. <laughs> okay, how many that time? Not so easy that time, was it? And, and these demos, by the way, they have a display being on the screen when I showed it to you for 250 milliseconds. That's an entire quarter of a second, which is pretty long for these purposes. Even so, when I've done this before, I've had people guess various numbers for that last trial, like seven or eight or nine or 10 dots. Kind of hard to know. People don't get it right anymore. Don't get it right consistently like they did with three, four or five. And sure enough, if we count it out individually, this is what there was on that last one. There are nine, but it takes time to count things out. And the problem is all that info doesn't sit still in sensory memory and wait for us to retrieve it and to count out, you know, each individual dot from sensory memory. Instead, it seems to start decaying away immediately. So we run out of time to count a larger number like this. And, and at much larger numbers, pretty much everyone starts failing consistently. So doing stuff like this, when, when like Jevons did this back in the 1800s, he found that around four to five objects could reliably be counted without error. But by the time we try eight or nine objects, accuracy dips to 50% or lower. Other people manipulated like stimulus duration, how long it was on the screen, how long the items showed up for. And what they found is as stimulus duration decreased, so if it's not shown very long on the screen, the number of objects that could be reliably counted drops off dramatically. So time matters. Obviously, if it's shown long enough, you can sit there and count, right? You can count through what you're seeing one part of the screen at a time. But the interesting thing for our purposes is when it's flashed super fast and then the stimulus is gone because that means the counting that we're doing all has to happen inside the head, inside of our memory. We're holding some or maybe all of those items in sensory memory to do the counting. Now, by the time the cognitive revolution came around in psychology in like the mid 20th century, people came up with some much better and, and more carefully controlled laboratory studies of sensory memory. So let's talk about one of the most famous, which is George Sperling's 1960 study called the partial report experiment. So in this case, the stimulus to use, uh, he, he, it wasn't it wasn't beans or dots like it had been used before, but but letters. So he had letters arranged in a controlled array, specifically three rows of four letters each, that he would flash really briefly to see how much information can be retained when we only get the briefest of glances at it, and how much information is lost or how quickly it's lost. So he flashed this array of letters on the screen for 50 milliseconds, which is one twentieth of a second. That's, that's super short. Think about how quickly a single second goes by and then divide that up into 20 pieces. 
So that's a 20th of a second, it's very short. So we'll try, we'll try an easier version of this task just to get a feel for it. But first I wanna give you an idea how fast the arrays are presented. So let's look at some examples. The first array will be displayed for 1000 milliseconds, meaning one whole entire second. The second array that you see, this is just a demo, will be for 500 milliseconds, meaning half a second. And the last example I show will be displayed for 100 milliseconds, so just a 10th of a second. So even in the final example that we're gonna see on the screen here, we'll be showing up for twice as long as what Sperling used. So here we go, one second, half second, and a 10th of a second examples. So that's one second. That was half a second. And that was a 10th of a second. Okay, so that's the idea. And what Sperling did in his initial setup, he called, it, he called it a whole report procedure. He just asked them to report the whole array of letters. In other words, to identify as many letters as possible. In each of those 12 spots, like after it flashed on the screen, they had to write down some letter in each spot, even if it was just a guess. And he checked how many they were able to get right across lots of trials. So let's do a, a quick and simple demo of this. If you wanna play along, pause and go grab a piece of paper and something to write with, then unpause the video when you're back. Okay, so I'm gonna flash an array real quick for each trial, just a 10th of a second, still twice as long as Sperling did, but I'm gonna flash it for a 10th of a second, and as soon as it disappears, you immediately write down all 12 letters in position, okay? If you can't remember a letter, you have to write some letter at each position in the array, even if it's just a guess. By the way, the same letter can appear more than once in an array. So this is a really hard task, even though we're slowing it down to half speed from Sperling's study. So just kind of do your best, okay? So again, I'll have you stare at the fixation point in the middle, and then it'll flash the letters. And as soon as they disappear, write down the 12 letters as best you can. All right, ready? Here we go. So write those down. Again, you'll write down three rows of four letters. Obviously, a lot of it might be a guess. That's okay. That's the procedure Sperling used. Okay, let's do a few more trials of this. Ready? Here we go. Write as many as you can remember and guess for the rest of them. Okay, let's do another trial. Ready, stare at the fixation point, it'll flash again, here we go. I know it's hard. Just do your best to play along. All right, we'll do one more trial. So same thing. Look at the screen. Ready? Here we go. Just guess if you don't remember. All right. So if you want to check your answers, you can pause the video here and actually just count up. Maybe give yourself one point for each letter that you got in the correct position. So since we did four trials, you'd add up your scores across all of those and divide by four to get your average, the average you got right in each trial. Uh, and in reality, by the way, Sperling had people do a ton of trials, but he also gave them lots of practice first before he did the actual memory test. So don't worry if you didn't do well on this, you didn't get nearly as much practice as Sperling's participants.
It was just kind of a demo, but that's his whole his whole report procedure. And across that, across that, and across all the participants he did for all their trials, he got an average of about 4.3 letters that could be recalled each trial when it showed on the screen for just 50 milliseconds, a 20th of a second. Which means sensory memory is pretty damn limited, right? Just a few items like Jevons found back in the 1800s. Not very impressive. But Sperling hypothesized this might actually be a big underestimate of the information that could be holding sensory memory. He thought more actually got in there, but maybe the image just fades so fast, the sensory memory just fades before he can write down all the information that was briefly held. So he added an experimental condition he called the partial report procedure, partial report condition. And his research design here, it's really elegant. In the partial report procedure, rather than trying to report the entire array of all 12 letters, the task for participants was simply to write down the letters on a particular row. So now when the 12 letters flash, they would only have to write down the top row or the bottom row or the middle or whatever. So here's the thing. If he just told them ahead of time which row they would be reporting on, then they could just pay attention to that row. And of course, they would get all four letters right or close to that. But it'd kind of be cheating, right, since they knew where to watch ahead of time. Instead, he wanted to know how much of the entire array got into their memory and then test how much of it was available in there, in our brain, in sensory memory, for them to kind of grab from in those brief moments afterward. So he needed to show the letters, then after they disappeared from the screen, he would ask people to retrieve one of the rows or another row from memory, so that way we'd know how much total was being stored in their sensory memory for them to grab from. So to do this partial report procedure, he had them fixate on the cross in the middle of the screen, just like before. He flashed the letters for 50, sec 50 milliseconds, just like before, which again, half the time that we saw them a minute ago, uh, like just long enough to create a bit of a visual after image basically. But here's the key. Once the letters disappeared from the screen, he would play a tone either a high pitched tone or a medium pitched tone or a low pitched tone. And that would tell them which row they had to report from memory. So they didn't know where to attend when the letters were still on the screen. But now that the letters have disappeared and they're off the screen, some or all of that information is in people's heads. Now they're asked to report on some subset of it. So let's try out that partial report version of the procedure. Let me give you an example of some high pitched, medium pitched, and low pitched tones. These aren't great, by the way. This is just to give you a feel for the idea. So you might close your eyes. I'm going to play them kind of quite a few times in random order just so you can tell the three tones apart. So here's the high pitch medium, and low. So let me just play through those randomly with your eyes closed so you can get used to them. That was medium. So high, medium, low. Got him? Okay. So when we do this partial report procedure, the order of the tones, it's going to be randomized. So don't try to predict where it'll be. Don't try to predict one row or another. It's going to be totally random. So it's important that you keep your eyes focused on the fixation point at the middle of the screen when the array of letters flashes. Then once that array of letters disappears, you're going to hear one of the tones. And when that tone sounds, immediately write down the four letters from that row, from the row associated with that tone. So the top row for the high tone, middle row if you hear the medium tone, and report the bottom row if you hear the low tone. You must write four letters for the indicated row, even if you're not sure all of them are correct. Just do your best. Make a guess if you have to. So again, you'll see the letters flash, then you'll hear a tone that tells you which row you should be reporting on. So here we go. Let's try out the partial report procedure. Just like before, look at the fixation cross. The letters will flash. Here we go. So again, you're just writing down four letters. You should have tried writing down the top row since that was a high pitched tone. Just as many as you're able, but make a guess for the ones you don't know. You only need to write down four letters, just the target row, ignore the rest. That's the idea with partial report. Let's do another trial. 
So stare at the screen, you'll see the fixation point, they'll flash, and then you'll hear the tone. Here we go. So that time you'd write down the middle row of letters as best you can, because it was the medium tone. Again, it's, it's randomized, so you might hear any of the three tones on a given trial. Let's do another one. Here we go. I know this is hard. <laughs> just do your best if you're playing along. Just do your best. Just guess. That one was high pitched. So again, you'd write down the top row. Let's do just a few more. So ready? Here we go with another one. That one was low pitched, so hopefully you're writing down the bottom row as best you can remember it. And yes, I realize it's very hard. His participants also didn't get all these letters, don't worry. Let's do a couple more trials. So ready? Here we go. Stare at the middle. So that one was the bottom row again. You just have to write down those four letters as best you can. Now let's do one more. So ready? Stare at the middle. Here we go. So you just write it down as best you can. Anyway, that is the, the idea with the partial report procedure. So if you want to, let's, let's check your score. But again, don't worry too much about how you did on this kind of half-assed version of the demo since you have no practice with it. His participants had tons of practice first. I just wanted you to get a feel for the procedure. So if you want to check your score, once again, just score one point for each letter you got in the correct position for the target row. Pause if you need to. Now, once you've done that, you need to add those up, right? So if you got one here and three of these and two on this one and one on this one, add all those up and divide by six to get your average. So you might pause and do that now. And your average might be something like 1.5 or whatever. Now, the average you calculated, that's just for a single row from the array, right? So actually, you want to multiply that by three to get an estimate of how much information you could have retrieved from the scene, depending on which tone played. So take that estimate that you got for each of these rows, the average across those, multiply by three. That's how much of the whole array we, we can estimate you had available if we had chosen to prompt to you know, send you to the top row or the bottom row or the middle row. Now, obviously, don't take your own personal attempts here too seriously. Like I said, Sperling Subjects got tons of training before he did the memory trials, and he also had people do way more attempts than just five or six in each of the conditions. So he was averaging across a bunch of people who had practiced this task. Also, he had everyone at exactly the same distance from the screen, using the same size of screen, same visual angle of the display. All these little variables were controlled to minimize confounds and noise. But across his participants, when he averaged things out, what did Sperling find? Here's the data from the original study. <clears throat> so let's start on the far right here. On the far right with the blue box, what we've got is the average for the whole report procedure. His first condition, where you try and remember the entire array, and people averaged 4.3 items across a bunch of trials. But in the partial report procedure, the one we just did with one row at a time, and then multiply by three, if you look on the far left here, he found the average of, of more than nine letters when the sound was cueing people right as the letters disappeared from the screen. Now, if he delayed the sound for a little while, like a tenth of a second or three tenths of a second, the average went down, meaning less of the letters were there to retrieve after even a fraction of a second. So some time goes by before you know which row you're supposed to be grabbing that information from. Remember, these partial report uh, numbers here, they're multiplied by three. So like after a one second delay, we estimate that 
um, you know, 4.5 of the letters are available because they're getting around 1.5 letters out of a single row that they were queued to using the tone, and 1.5 times 3 is 4.5, that kind of thing, after a full second. So 4.5, that means they were getting 1.5 in each row, but we multiplied by 3 to get that dot there. So here, when, when we say around 9 or a little over 9 of the items were available from the whole entire array, that means they were getting, with no delay, about three right in each trial, and then we multiply that by three in the partial report trials. So that first data point on the left, though, that's the most important one, this one here. It means we're getting like three letters on average from a given row, nine letters available in our memory total from the whole thing, the instant the stimulus has disappeared from the screen. So most of the info that we're exposed to is briefly getting into sensory memory, even if most of it just fades quicker than we can access all of it. In fact, Sperling thought all 12 letters are probably getting into memory, but the image and sensory memory, it just fades so fast, it fades faster than the time it takes to write down or speak even one single row of letters, which is why the score isn't a perfect 12, even in the partial report procedure. Likely we do get all 12 letters briefly into sensory memory, but it just starts decaying out so quickly that even if we try, we can't retrieve some of it before it's too far gone. So the big takeaway lesson from his study is that basically all of the information, all the sensory information hitting our eyes is maintained in the visual system for a very brief period of time, but then it completely decays within the first second. That's why I said before that sensory memory is very brief and holds information for on the order of a second or so. By the way, his partial report procedure, it's been replicated a bunch of times. Even back in the 60s, they did variations like this one here with uh, 16 items in this case that would flash for a 20th of a second. So again, 50 milliseconds. And then after the letters disappeared, a mark would appear above one of the letters where one of the letters had previously been. And if they multiplied an average across a ton of trials, came out to about 12 of the 16 of those letters were available, though again, that's probably an underestimate of how much actually gets in, which may be closer to all of it. Like, in some sense, every moment you're awake, your system is registering every bit of light that hits your retina and fires a photoreceptor from every single angle of the periphery. So much information. But of course, most of that information doesn't go any further into processing, so you never experience it. You don't see it. And you can't use that information, which at that point, it's just gone for good. But clearly, some information doesn't permanently decay, or we'd have no memory at all and no conscious experience of seeing or perceiving anything at all. So what determines which bits of information from everything that hits our sensory receptors, everything that hits our eyes, what determines which bits of information get passed on rather than decaying away quickly? And that's where we'll add a new little note in our modal model a little flowchart diagram, a little detail at the arrow between sensory memory and short-term memory, which is attention. It turns out attention is super important for sensory memory. Specifically, the things you attend to are what gets transferred to short-term memory. Things you don't attend to immediately just decay away forever unused. So if you're paying attention to my voice right now, your brain is understanding these words and causing thoughts, and you might remember some of it later, but if you get distracted by a text on your phone and you're reading your phone while my voice is droning on and on in the background, the sound of my voice might be hitting your ears and getting into sensory memory briefly, but then it just decays away and it won't get into short-term memory, so you won't learn or remember any of it. So if your attention is elsewhere, the information that hits your sensory receptors doesn't really do much. Which, by the way, brings me to an important detail when I talk about hearing something. Sperling used in his study, he used a visual stimulus. He was flashing letters in front of people's eyes, right? And we call that visual a form of short-term memory, or sorry, of sensory memory. We call it iconic memory. So iconic memory is the visual side of sensory memory, stuff that hits our eyes. Like we saw, that info is pretty much gone within one second. But there's also an auditory version of sensory memory. What hits your ears briefly gets stored, some of which, whatever we attend to, some of which goes to short-term memory. That auditory version is called echoic memory. The auditory version of sensory memory is echoic memory. This lasts um, a little bit longer, so on the order of a couple of seconds. And this is why, like, if your attention is wandering during a conversation, but you catch yourself and you come back to the conversation, you might say, what? And then before the person repeats what they were saying, you're actually able to respond to it. 
the very last thing they said, those sounds that were still going through the initial processing in your brain, that info was still available for just a brief couple of seconds where you can go and retrieve it by turning your attention to it. But if you stayed tuned out of the conversation for three or four seconds, those sounds have decayed away for good and you won't know what they said without them actually repeating themselves. And by the way, there's also like a haptic version of sensory memory for touches we just felt and so on. You get the idea. But of course, iconic memory is the most well studied just because vision in general has been way more studied than the other senses. Meanwhile, if you're wondering where sensory memory comes from, like mechanistically, what's the basis for it in neurological terms, it's basically the persistent firing of neurons, like our sensory receptors and our early sensory processing in the brain, mostly kind of pre-attentive and pre-conscious processing. But like for vision, these early levels of registering edges and combinations of edges and starting to process what shape things are, that's the, the level of brain activity we're talking about in that early processing before it reaches the point of us actually perceiving and experiencing the sight of it. Only the stuff that we attend to goes on for that further processing and we actually are aware and, and see it. Anyway, enough about sensory memory. We now see how when we apply attention, then some information gets from this initial level of processing to the further stage we're more familiar with, what we call short-term memory. And that's what the next couple of videos will dive into as we hit the next big box in our modal model of memory.